Wait, what? There are proper mnemonics? Proper mnemonics that work better than inferior mnemonics? Says who? Thousands of years of memory tradition, detailed scientific studies that include word-based absorption based on the aboriginal memory techniques most recently, and a whole bunch of memory competitors who year after year break through records in memorizing words. You know, some of these competitors are so bored of memorizing words that when I was recently invited to serve as a commentator at the Pan American Open Memory Competition, I watched memory competitors memorize cloud formations instead. How did they memorize cloud formations? Using words based on numbers that they had already memorized. Think about that. There are mnemonic strategies so high-powered, competitors use them to memorize almost two dozen abstract shapes in less than a minute using words in their minds. And if I sound super authoritative to the point of arrogance when I claim to you that there are better ways of using mnemonics in your language learning, really I'm just being a custodian of the tradition. I've studied it deeply for my own use in language learning, and although I know that memory techniques aren't for everyone, I just don't do rote learning myself. In fact, I can't get myself to do it. It's too boring, especially when there are memory techniques. And I can do rote learning all the less after I read about how rote learning is shown to reduce critical thinking skills. And once you hear that, it's actually pretty obvious that that's what's been going on. So let's get creative and get together to celebrate memory techniques. Shan't we? In this video, made in collaboration with Fluent in Three Months, let's distinguish the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to language learning using mnemonics. The bad really comes down to having no strategy, no mnemonic technique that you've developed, and no consistency in using the techniques in an elevated, quote-unquote, proper manner. We're going to fix the inconsistency issue in part two of this series because that's a function of courage at the end of the day. But for now, Understanding that no matter how technically proficient you get with mnemonics, the value of that proficiency is directly tied to your consistency with using your mental chops. And chops with mnemonics comes down to a few things. First, it comes down to having well-formed memory palaces. These are like a tool or a set of toolboxes that we use as containers where we work with our mnemonic associations. Second, we have specific mnemonics that I call magnetic imagery. These are multi-sensory associations that are not necessarily images, but they are ideally based on visual things at their core, such as people. But they can also be based on sounds and sensations, and people can be extended to be based on sounds and sensations. So for example, if you use a celebrity as an association to help you memorize a word, you hear the sound of their voice in your mind's ear. You feel shaking their hand in your mind's kinesthetic physical sensation machine. It's this existing familiarity that you weave together with the dimensionalization of multi-sensory association that really makes your mind pop and memories form faster. Although there's a little bit more to it than that, of course. And yeah, a little bit more means a little bit more understanding and a little bit more that you need to practice. But as things become more and more strategic, they become more and more automatic in your practice. Third, you need a system of review that harnesses precisely what memory palaces are when used in conjunction with magnetic imagery and what magnetic imagery can do for you. When it comes to language learning, we know repetition is the key, but just how repetitive do you need to be? When, not if, when you're doing proper reading, writing, speaking, and listening, you're going to get more than enough repetition. And so, mnemonics used well will provide you with rocket fuel. But the rocket fuel is obviously not for visiting the moons of fluency anytime soon without reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And as Benny says, from day one. 
So you'll need more than repetition to form memories. You'll want to have mnemonics. Now, these aren't matters of right or wrong or good or bad. They're just scientific certainties related to how the brain forms connections. So it's really just a matter of how much, how often, not really anything other than that. In the best of all possible worlds, we're percolating lots of vocabulary and phrases through what I often call the big five systems of raw memorization with reading, speaking, listening, and writing. That's the big five. So with the big picture in place, how do you make your associations more magnetic? This is the fun part. In order to get started doing this, in order to get rid of all this nonsense that old dogs can't learn new tricks and all that, you just act like a child. You get out a big old piece of paper and some colored pens. And then you write out the alphabet from A to Z. And then start to write out a list of celebrities, friends, family members, teachers, if you can stomach them, politicians, and you'll train your mind to do this. The way I like to do this is just change the colors as I go through every name. This gives a little bit of diffuse thinking and a little bit of percolation. You can look into the memory science of how all that works on your own if you like. The point is, is that learning to use mnemonics really well does indeed involve becoming a kid again. Don't be in the prison of adulthood. I mean, let's be adults, of course. Let's be mature, as I call smarter in one of my books. Serious, mature, and ready to embrace reality. But part of embracing reality is being willing to be like a kid again. Okay? So once you've got the alphabet listed, just find one association per letter of the alphabet and base it on the most famous or most familiar person you can think of. Someone who means something to you. So for me, Adam West played Batman. I loved that series as a kid. Spent hours and hours and hours and hours watching it. So now I've got an A, a very familiar A. An A I can hear Adam West's voice. I can imagine shaking his hand. If I wanted to, I could imagine what he smells like. Now, speaking of Batman, Christian Bale also played Batman. So I can list him for C or B, Christian Bale. Now, you might notice something here. A is for Adam, Christian is for C, Christian could be a C or B. Isn't this going to confuse me? That's up to you in your practice. Consistency makes everything clear. It is the origin of control. Doing is the origin of competence. I don't get precious about this. I don't mind if I get confused or make a mistake every once in a while. I learn from my mistakes. So I have this kind of mistake OCD. I try to get as many mistakes going as possible so I can observe the mistakes and then reduce them through practice. So just lean into them and know thyself when you are going through these exercises. Know that you have certain objections. You have certain worries and fears. Write them down too. Get them out of your head so you can read them objectively and, you know, it's a function of courage. So you could then write down, how can I get the courage to overcome these objections? Because all Dr. Metivier is asking me to do is play like a kid. Is that really so hard? You're looking for the ability to look at words and have your mind produce decent associations in a flash, words in any language, and then phrases. So it doesn't really matter whether you're using first or last names when you're making your links. They will work, and they will work relative to your practice, your frequency of practice. And look, omnium expedendorum prima espentia, in qua perfecti boni forma consistit. That's Latin. I memorized it really in a couple of minutes. And I just used celebrities in a memory palace and the meaning of that phrase is choose wisdom first above all things because in the choice of wisdom is the form of goodness itself. So I'm telling you, just do this. Be a child. Play. Form the associations in advance so that you've got them. Now, what happens if you're doing this exercise and you can't come up with something for a letter like X? Well, I've been there. Now I have Xenophon, Zentipia, Xerxes, Xena. I have my pal, Cain X. Fauché, who I met in university. The X is for Xavier in this case. I have Professor Xavier from the X-Men stories. I have X-Men itself as a category from which I can unpack all kinds of associations, such as that Latin phrase, expatendorum. Well, I used Wolverine. 
His name doesn't have X in it, but he's an X-Men and he can make his claws X-Men-like. Listen, if you really can't come up with anything for X, just come back to it later. Now, let's go a little bit deeper into a case study. I have been tackling Latin lately, and I wanted to memorize this cool phrase that I just told you. Omnium expedendorum prima es sapentia in qua perfecti boni forma consiste. And yes, I like to roll those R's extra because it's like the dog growling, as the Latin people said, and it just feels really good. So again, this basically means that choosing wisdom is the most important thing of all because in the choice of wisdom is goodness itself. So everything is just based on looking at the letters. We can take omnium. I thought about Optimus Prime, not a perfect fit, but close enough. And I thought of O2 World in Berlin. It makes for a nice palette upon which to paint. Why O2 World? Because it has that O, Omnium, right? And Optimum. Now, moving left to right in a memory palace, all of these associations are placed in a memory palace. I just look at the words and assign images as I've trained my mind to do. So Optimus Prime is kneeing over a bunch of tasty yams, Omnium. And Wolverine, as I said, he's an X-Man, and so he's at a pet barn, and he's got a ten of spades, Omnium Expetendorum. He's pounding his claws into pet barn, and where? Well, the door, Omnium Expetendorum. And the, the, I think of specific things, like the door in The Shining, where Jack Nicholson has gone mad, and he's pounding through that door with an axe. And, you know, in that movie, the boy has often said, Red rum! Red rum! Red rum! Omnium expatendorum. So, thank you Stephen King and Stanley Kubrick for scaring our pants off. Makes that one a little bit easier to remember, doesn't it? Now, there's another reason to come up with an image like Optimus Prime, because later in the phrase, prima es sapentia. Prime, Optimus Prime. Now, this is a principle called the bridging figure. I can't always predict in advance that it's going to work out that way, but if you didn't have Optimus Prime, you could think of the Amazon Prime logo if you can stomach the big corporations in your memory palaces. I can. You can use prints or whatever. And, you know, we don't judge the images. We just use them. We weave them into space. Very, very important. If you can do it for three words, you'd better believe you can do it for 3,000 and beyond. But please, don't talk yourself out of it and say, but my language has 30,000 words. This is just one word at a time. If you can't memorize three words, you're not going to memorize 30,000. And we'll talk later in this series about how this scales. The trick is in making sure you have the memory palaces in advance and you have some dexterity in coming up with associations to make this happen as quickly as possible. You don't want to think abstractly about pet. You want to be specific about a store like Pet Barn. Now, to be fair, there are some people who can get away with abstractions, but that certainly isn't me. And in my experience, it isn't most people either. All right, so there's a final bit here to consider, and that's what I call recall rehearsal. Now, there's a big, long scientific story about this. I've talked about it on my YouTube channel in a video about spaced repetition and on my podcast and blog. Don't worry about this. If it sounds weird, I will teach it to you, okay? It definitely stretches your brain. According to the science of active recall, that's the point. No stretching, no memory formation in as optimal form as is your birthright as a human being with a brain. The stretch works like this for much, much faster installation of robust memory. You don't just recall the sentence you've memorized forward, or indeed even the word. What you do is you recall sentences and words in different orders, using the memory palace as a frame of reference to help you do it. If you just keep recalling things from beginning to end, you create too much of what scientists call primacy effect on the opening of the word. So if I constantly start that phrase, omnium expedendorum, etc., from the beginning, I'm going to remember omnium real, real well, but when we get to perfecti, bona, uh, perfecti boni forma consistent later, that's not going to be nearly as sharp. So what I do to use recall rehearsal, this is all basically in Aristotle from thousands of years ago, and it is introduced in science from Erman Hemminghaus a little over a hundred years ago, is we skip the words 
and we really just follow the odd words on one pass, the even words on another pass, and forward and backward. And it's really, really powerful. It's not just for this sentence. I've done this with the over 1,700 words of Sanskrit that I've memorized in phrases for long-form mantra meditation. I did my TEDx talk, which is about the memorization of mantra. Uh, it is something that I did forward and backwards in this way. It, it sounds crazy to go through a TEDx talk backwards, but I did it because I wanted to memorize it as quickly as possible. Instead of going over it a hundred times, why not go over it five, right? That's basically why that you do this and you do it in language learning as well. I've done it with dozens of lines from German, a couple of German songs, and I can still reasonably sing those songs from memory, Mandarin, etc. I know it's weird, but it's worth it. And when you compare the speed of absorption from these patterns and the memory palaces and the magnetic imagery to rote, well, not only do you operate faster, but you avoid the damage that rote learning does to your critical thinking. So for this reason alone, if no other, proper mnemonics, and I do indeed claim that there are proper mnemonics, proper mnemonics are the only game in town.